From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on Friday, January 28th. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. Whiplash week. Stocks can't seem to find a footing after a week of price swings not seen since 2008. Selling pressure prevailing for now as investors question whether fundamentals or tighter policy matter more to this market. How do you like them, Apples? Apple works through supply chain issues to deliver a blowout quarter, but it's not enough to lift sentiment for tech stocks heading to their worst January on record. And missing the mark, Mondelez and Chevron shares drop after earnings come up short. We'll speak with the CEOs of both companies this hour. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, it has been a week that has felt like a month and a month that has felt like a year. Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> Are we nearly there yet? That certainly should be the tagline for today. Uh, one more day to go of this month uh, in terms of trading. Let's talk about the data because one of the most important pieces of data breaking onto the Bloomberg terminal right now, the University of Michigan uh, Consumer Sentiment Survey out a little fade. I, I think, to be honest, uh, I'm surprised that it's not more given the narrative around inflation right now, uh, but the consumer is still feeling relatively perky. 67.2 is the number. We're down from 68.8. This is the headline number. The market, the economists we surveyed had expected that number to remain static. Uh, in terms of current conditions, 72. Again, a fade from 73.2. Expectations down to 64.1 from 65.9. So across the board, both current and future, we are seeing the consumer beginning to back off just a little bit in terms of how they're feeling about the world around them. Uh, in terms of the inflation narrative, this is the interesting bit. This is where actually things have changed mm -hmm. the least here. It's on the front page, Kaylee, of every single newspaper out there at the moment. Uh, the president is talking about it day in, day out. One-year inflation expectations, 4.9. 5 to 10, 3.1. Both of those numbers unchanged. And we know the Fed is looking closely at those numbers as well as the numbers we got earlier this morning when it comes to the PCE deflator as well as the employment cost index. Here to break it all down for us is Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Mike, how is the Fed looking at this data? How do you make sense of it? Well, the Fed is going to look at it as a continuation of what we were experiencing through the fourth quarter. Now, the Michigan data is for January, but we did have the Omicron variant running wild in the country at that time. So it's no wonder that we see a bit of a decline, although this is a little bit more than a bit of a decline. It's the lowest since 2011 for the uh, Michigan current uh, sentiment index. Current conditions at 72 and expectations at 64.1 suggest that we did have an impact, but will there be an impact on spending? There was in December, we had the consumer spending numbers come out along with incomes and spending was down six tenths on the month, a significant drop after a four tenths gain in November. People uh, putting off uh, buying early and then putting off any uh, pur purchases around the holidays. The uh, core deflator comes in and Kaylee mentioned that at 4.9 percent. The overall is 5.8 percent. So inflation is back in terms of uh, where we are with uh, the uh, cost of living. Now, uh, as Kaylee mentioned, the employment cost index rose significantly uh, up 1 percent on the month, 1.2 percent for wages. Wages still rising. And with uh, the PCE index, it just shows you that workers are falling farther and farther behind in terms of keeping up with inflation. All right, Bloomberg's Mike McKee, thank you so much. We do now see bond yields flat after that data. They had been up at 185 on the 10-year. Now we're back down to sub 180 at the moment. That's the bond market. Let's take a look at the action we've seen this week, though, in the equity market. It's been wild, to say the least. And Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is here taking a look at the technicals. Abigail? Well, Kelly, it certainly has been a wild week. Volatility is the name of the game. We were talking about that last week, and boy, has it shown up. Now, one of the key charts to take a look at, of course, is the VIX. We took a look at a uh, chart of the VIX earlier this year. Now, 
Now this is a, the VIX. This is the intraday volatility, and you can see that the VIX more recently has been uh, hitting close to highs, but coming down just a little bit. So that suggests that maybe there's some relief ahead for these wild intraday swings that we've been seeing relative to the VIX itself. This chart would support it. We took a look at this chart earlier this week. I think this is one of the most critical charts you can look at. You can see that the VIX has basically been trading in a range. The range of 2020 was between 20 and 40 to keep it clean. That's the way we have this charted. So long as the VIX is below 40, but really below 30, right now slightly above it, but this candle suggests that we could see the VIX drop back down toward 20 or even lower, suggesting that maybe we're going to see the S&P 500 uh, take another move higher. That said, you have the Russell 2000 and the SOX, that chip index, both in bear markets. That's pretty brutal. A critical chart relative to the Russell 2000 uh, suggests that it could, it's very, very unclear, frankly, if we take a look at that chart. And here's that VIX chart, too, in terms of the intraday volatility. Again, a reason to think it's going to come down. But the Russell 2000, a weekly chart, hitting support, but we really haven't seen support uh, hit all that much. This is the AAII uh, chart, and you can see that sentiment super, super bearish, more bearish than it was actually uh, at any other time during the pandemic. That's a reason to think that there's a bounce. But again, the S&P 500, if we take a look at the Russell 2000 in the Bloomberg terminal, we will see that this index in its bear market is hitting onto critical support. So what we're looking at here is the 200-week moving average in yellow, and in blue, you have the 100 week moving average. Both are slightly rising. That is bullish. You also see the Russell 2000 hitting right down in that 100 week moving average. The RSI momentum indicator toward the bottom. It's unclear whether it's going to be like 2020 where it's just a slice right below or 2018 where a little bit of bobbing around. Either way, there is reason to think that if there is a near term bounce that we are perhaps in a sell the rips regime. The big reason why, Guy, of course, it's all about a repricing of risk. If we take a look at our last chart in the Bloomberg terminal, keeping it simple with yields, last Last week, we talked about how it seemed likely that the 10-year yield could go up to 225. Uh, this chart, this long-term chart of the 10-year uh, yield, really supports it, keeping it very simple. We have this yield going down, but above the critical level, it points to 2.5%, suggesting that maybe the yield curve is going to steepen just a little bit if the two-year yield comes up less, which there's reason to think that might be the case, Guy. Such a whippy, hard to figure out market right now. So much going on. So many cross trends, Abigail, bringing them together quite nicely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, lots to factor in. One of the other things that we need to factor in is what is happening with the earnings story. Do earnings matter in an environment where we are so top down, where we are so macro? I want to talk about these two stocks here. And I know that the market is down hard, Kaylee, today. And you can see what is happening on the screens right now. Session lows being hit. But Apple had a sensational quarter. Those numbers were absolutely amazing. And you can say the same for LVMH last night after it posted after the close. Super, super strong numbers even versus the pre-pandemic um, levels that we were watching, like records for both. So what we've got here is a situation where I, I appreciate that, that earnings do matter and you're seeing some outperformance today, but do they matter enough? Which brings me to kind of exhibit B. And this is what is happening with the S&P uh, versus uh, what is happening uh, with the earnings story. Um, I'm not sure you can actually see the earnings estimates there on that screen. Uh, they seem to be missing a little bit. But earnings basically have been tracking the S&P. And now I think you can just about see it in the background there. I think the colours don't really stand out. Um, but the, the earnings story is still elevated, whereas the S&P has come down. So how do, you, how do you deal with the earnings narrative? Do fundamentals matter in this very much macro-driven market? Let's try and get an answer to that question. Kate Faddis, Grace Capital, President and CIO, joins us now. Grace, it has been an incredible month, an incredible week. We're in the middle of earnings season. You've got stocks like Apple and LVMH posting absolutely amazing numbers, yet they're not really getting significantly rewarded for it. What do you do in this kind of environment if you are a bottom-up stocks uh, analyzer and you're trying to figure out what are the right calls and what are the wrong calls? Thank you for having me, Guy. First of all, you do nothing. You do nothing. You have you've set your strategic asset allocation and you keep it there. Tactically, however, you can make some changes. I would hold more cash and I would hold safe stocks. I like the dividend aristocrats. I like utilities. I like boring. That's what I would do. 
Kate, we just have a red headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now. Wall Street has been briefed by the Biden team on possible Russian sanctions. We understand Citibank of America and JP Morgan are among the firms in Russian uh, in discussions on these Russian sanctions. Uh, we'll have more on this from our Anne Marie Hoarder down in Washington in just a moment. But from a market perspective, Kate, how do you look at the Ukraine Russia issue and what kind, if any at all, of a geopolitical risk premium is in this market right now? I don't, I don't look at those things at all. I don't think they're very important. You know, in the short term, they will affect the market. They'll affect volatility. Longer term, they're really not very important. I don't know any market watcher who's saying I'm going to buy stocks or not buy stocks because, because of Ukraine. I think it'll sort, it, sort itself out. Now, could it affect fundamentals for a gas utility in, your, in your Ukraine, in Europe? Possibly. Anything short of that, I, I think it's market noise. OK, there's a lot of noise around at the moment, Kate. Um, how are you figuring it all out? Uh, you've got, obviously, the Fed. The, the market is going from two hikes to three hikes to four hikes to five hikes. Uh, Bank of America says seven hikes. How are you factoring that in? I spoke to you before Christmas, and you said you want to be fully invested in this market. Does that still apply when we still don't know what the Fed is going to do and ultimately how aggressive it's going to be? Because we don't have the data yet to make that determination. No, it does not still apply, Guy. Look, we had three great years. The other time, last time we spoke, I said there's going to be a Santa Claus rally and then watch out in January. Here we are in January. You got to go safe. This market has been very clear. The Fed has been very clear. The Fed is going to raise rates. This mm -hmm. is going to affect the market. When uh, the Fed chairman spoke, he was very clear. He cares about the real economy. He does not care about the stock market. The Fed raise may or may not affect the real economy, but if you're holding equities, I would be very careful in this environment. So high, Kate, high beta growth names, no way. Kate, if we have to go safe, does that mean going to cash? I, I Going to cash is always a beautiful thing. You don't have to go to cash. Again, I love, there's some great dividend paying stocks that you can go hide in if you don't want to go to cash. Because the problem with going to cash is we're still in an inflationary environment. So you're going to have going to cash and you're going to miss out on 7% a year, 6% inflation. I would rather go into some dividend paying stocks. Okay, there, there are lots of them out there. They're boring. They don't grow much. They give you a nice 4.5% yield. There are several. Yep. Is that going to be enough? Is that going to be a relative outperformance of those stocks going to be going up this year or are they just going to be going down less, Kate? I think they're going to be going down less. If you're lucky, they're going to be going up. Ener some of the energy names we like, something like a Chenier, I think that's going to be going up. The energy names are going to be going up. Some of the other ones, Abvi, Abvi, I think is very interesting. Nice yield, realty income. But in a general sense, you're not going to escape the big move. This market is probably headed into bear territory. You're not going to escape that. So I, I think at the very least, you can protect your assets a little more. I would also look at going into fixed income. I think that would be interesting if the 10 years at 2%. Okay, we talked about there is no alternative. Now you've got an alternative going to mm. the 10 year yield at 2%. Not bad. All right. Maybe Tina doesn't last forever. And maybe the Fed put doesn't last forever either. Kate Faddis, Greece Capital President and CIO. Thank you very much. Now, we do want to get back to the breaking news from down in Washington. The Biden administration has held conversations with some of the country's largest banks, including Citi, J.P. Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America regarding possible Russian sanctions. Let's get more on this Bloomberg scoop now and bring in Bloomberg's Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern, who is down in Washington. Anne-Marie, what else can you tell us? Well, there's relatively a small portion of U.S. banks that have a large uh, scope in terms of what they are presented to in their work in Russia. But what the administration does seem to be worried about when you look at this story and the reporting by our colleagues is the spillover effects. And we saw that in 2018 when the United States had sanctions on Russia. Then we saw what happened in the aluminum prices specifically, and they shot up soaring. And then that becomes a, another issue, an issue within the commodity market, an issue with supply chains. So that's one of the things the officials have been briefing these banks about. Also, given this reporting, it does look like the U.S. seems to be honing in with their Western allies on cutting Russia's off on their ability to convert currency. Remember, this would be very, very difficult for Russian banks and Russian companies, especially energy companies yep. that do tons of trade, and they have to convert their rubles or the dollars into their rubles in local currency. Does this give us any indication as well that the SWIFT um, exclusion may also be on the table, excluding 
Russia from the SWIFT financial system? So it does seem like the banks have been asking about how likelihood are we going to get that nuclear option of barring Russia from the SWIFT payment system. And it seems to be only coming up in conversations marginally, which has me thinking that the administration is still considering that, but it very much so is the nuclear option. That would be a hard pill to uh, swallow, Guy, for some of the European allies like Germany. Absolutely. Um, and we have this call that has taken place uh, between Emmanuel Macron and mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin. France saying within the last couple of minutes that uh, Putin denied on that call offensive intentions vis-a-vis uh, -vis mm -hmm. Ukraine. So we'll get more of a readout from that call uh, as we work our way through the next half hour, I suspect. Amory Hodern, great coverage as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Washington correspondent, Amory Hodern, joining us from DC. What are we going to do next? It's a related subject. Uh, fourth quarter earnings falling short at Chevron, the first of the energy giant's companies to report. Uh, we're going to figure out what's happening here. We're going to talk to the man himself, the CEO of the company, Mike Worth. Up next, this is Bloomberg. Chevron posting disappointing profits in the last three months of the year. The oil giant's earnings missed expectations. And of course, it is the first of the five international super majors to report. Let's get more on this now. We're joined by the company's chairman and CEO, Mike Worth. Mike, great to talk to you. It seems that a lot of this miss had to do with slumping valuations for some legacy assets, long-held oil fields. Is that why you weren't able to further capitalize on the gains we've seen in energy prices? Well, good morning, Kaylee. Uh, we had some non-cash charges in the fourth quarter that are very difficult for analysts to anticipate and model. We'll go through that on the call here, and, uh, and I think that they'll understand afterwards. Uh, when you look at cash, this was another record quarter. It's the second quarter in a row with record free cash flow, and our annual free cash flow was 25% higher than the best year we've ever seen before. So the underlying business is very healthy. Uh, we increased our dividend earlier this week by 6%, and that's the 35th year in a row where we've increased our dividend payout. Uh, it's up almost 20% since 2019 when others in the industry actually cut dividends uh, through the pandemic. We yield twice what the 10-year yields right now on our dividend, and our share buybacks are at the top of the guidance range. So uh, we're in a very, very strong place and set up for a, a really good 2022. Mike, as you say, uh, the, the top line looked amazing. The cash flow really strong. The share price has been on an absolute tear of late. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you, you mentioned the, the dividend and the buybacks. You've gone for a 6% increase in the dividend, as you say. You announced that a day or so back. My question to you is, are you, are you favoring the dividend over buybacks because of that incredible run you've seen in the share price? Well, we have um, many shareholders that really value the dividend to your earlier segment about uh, companies and industries that provide steady, reliable dividend growth over time. And so our shareholders really value the dividend. Uh, we have a, a robust capital program, which is down significantly from what it was just a few years ago. Very disciplined reinvestment to generate those future cash flows, a strong balance sheet, and then we have, uh, in this environment, uh, cash that's surplus to those needs. And, uh, and we've got a history of returning that through share repurchases. We've actually repurchased shares 15 of the last 19 years. And so our investors understand uh, our track record. And I think this is very consistent with what they expect to see. Obviously, the run-up in your share price also has to do a lot uh, with the run-up we've seen in oil. Brent, $91 a barrel, a WTI, $88 a barrel. Do you anticipate $100 oil, and in what time frame? Well, Kaylee, it's, uh, you know, predicting oil prices is fraught with, uh, with, with difficulty. Uh, we are in what has been an up market here now as the economy uh, grows and we begin to put the pandemic behind us. And, and we've seen demand growth uh, very strong, even before we see people returning to normal office commutes, uh, international uh, travel or business travel returning to pre-pandemic levels. So demand has been strong. Supply has been uh, struggling a little bit to keep up with that. And that's reflected in, in the market. And then, of course, we also have 
uh, you know, geopolitics that, that uh, are present again. A few years ago, uh, these types of events didn't seem to uh, really impact commodity markets, and today they appear to be doing so. And so, you know, $100 is, uh, is certainly, uh, you know, within the realm of, of what we could see in the next few months. Longer term, we think markets rebalance and, and prices will moderate. You may get some extra production coming on stream, Mike, if we get to 100. I'm not saying, saying you, but, but others might decide to make that decision. Um, the word discipline is the word that I've heard most when I talk to energy CEOs uh, at the moment. Uh, every conversation I have seems to include the word discipline. Do you think that discipline is maintained? I, what are your plans going forward? If we get to $100 a barrel, what, what do your plans look like in the Permian? Are you going to be increasing production? How do you see the landscape developing? Well, our production in 2021 was a record. It's the highest it's ever been. Permian was up 10% just quarter on quarter as we closed the year. And as we look to 2022, uh, we've got a couple of big contracts in Asia that expire. And uh, if you set those aside, we'll grow again uh, 2 to 5% in 2022. So uh, we're responding to the demand in, in markets, but we're doing it with capital discipline. That's a key word that you mentioned. Uh, our budget is at the low end of our external guidance. And if you look at uh, our company plus Noble Energy, who we acquired during the pandemic, uh, in 2019, uh, capital spending was twice what it was in 2021. So we're much more capital efficient today. We can generate uh, the, the production and, and the growth in, in a, a much more capital efficient manner, which allows us to generate the free cash, uh, which can then flow back to shareholders. That's our plan. Uh, certainly others in the industry uh, have seem to have similar plans. And I think that discipline is, uh, is what this industry has needed. You mentioned there, Mike, both your strong capital position as well as a previous acquisition you have made. Do you see any more M&A in your near future to build out your asset base? Well, Kaylee, you know, we've got a history of, uh, of well-timed acquisitions over the years, and uh, that's certainly part of uh, our DNA. Uh, but the, the discipline that Guy referenced uh, needs to apply in M&A as well. And in a market where commodity prices are elevated and equities are beginning to reflect that, uh, I think we have to be very uh, prudent in, in how we think about that. And so we're always uh, on the alert for a value creating uh, transactions for our shareholders, uh, but we don't need to do anything uh, unless it's really uh, a deal that is, uh, is a good one. Mike, um, we broke the news just a few minutes ago that Wall Street firms are being briefed by the administration on possible sanctions were Russia, was Russia, if Russia goes in to the Ukraine and what those sanctions might look like for the financial sector. The real concern over here in Europe is what that would mean for gas prices, for energy security. Um, there has been some suggestion that the administration is trying to find a way to deal with that risk, possibly talking to Gutter. Um, and I'm wondering whether the same conversations are happening with the big U.S. energy companies such as yourself. Have you had any conversations with the administration? Do you think that the U.S. could help Europe uh, were there to be a gas crisis? Uh, again, how do you see this story developing and what role do you think you may play? He I, Guy, I'm not going to comment on what discussions we may or may not have had with the administration. I think there's been plenty of media reporting uh, that indicates uh, the U.S. administration and governments in Europe are uh, sensitive to the current low level of gas inventories in Europe and the risks that exist should there be armed conflict uh, that would break out in Ukraine. There's certainly uh, a lot of gas that flows through Ukraine into Europe from Russia. Uh, the U.S. is producing a lot of gas and exporting it right now uh, to Europe. The prices uh, that we see in the market incentivize that, and uh, and 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 we could see uh, you know further strength in prices if these anxieties increase. Inventories in in Europe are at a, a, a relatively low level for uh, this time of year, and uh, and I think governments around the world are in contact with one another to understand what they might be able to do collectively to address that situation if it were to worsen. And, and certainly we operate around the world and uh, would look to do what we could uh, to support those kinds of efforts. Mike, we appreciate that. Thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate that as well. Mike Worth, the Chevron chairman and CEO, sir. 
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Brake crew currently trading uh, up. We're at 91.14. TI 88.21. Not very far away from 90 either. Coming up, Apple gaining the upper hand against those supply chain shortages. Execution really strong. Sales soaring to a record. What does it mean for some of the other heavyweights in the space? Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon. They all report next week. We'll talk tech next. This is Bloomberg. We're about an hour into the U.S. trading day. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking the moves. And on the move we are, Abigail. We're up, we're down, we're up again, we're down again. Indeed, a volatility, the name of the game. But this is the week that was or is. Take a look at the S&P 500 down 1.9%, down four weeks in a row. That's the longest losing weekly streak going back to September of 2020. The Nasdaq 100 down 3.2%. The composite, however, down for a fifth week in a row. The longest weekly losing streak going back to 2012. And these markets do feel a lot like that 2011 2012 time period. So interesting. And of course, we have bear markets in both the Sox and the Russell 2000. Those leading indicators, you can see uh, with those kinds of declines why. As for the day, how will we end? Let's take a look at the intraday chart of the S&P 500 E-mini futures because much of the session overnight higher than down and then up and down and up, down a little. So that intraday volatility really, really continuing. Very interesting. One sector that has gotten overshadowed this week because of all the movement in rates and stocks. If we take a look at metals, in particular some of the metal ETFs. The gold ETF, GLD, down about six tenths of one percent, down many days in a row. Uh, the silver ETF, SLV, down about 1.6 percent. We have TLT right now lower. That, of course, means yields are higher. That could be one pressure. And of course, the dollar about flat. But on the week, the dollar is up sharply, pressuring these metals. If we go into the Bloomberg terminal and take a look at what is happening with GLD, technically, there may be reason to think that GLD could continue to decline. You can see this downtrend here in GLD. There's different ways to look at this range, but this range may suggest, especially since there's a death cross, that's when the 50-day moving average goes below the 200-day moving average, suggesting the near-term buyers are out, that we could go back down in the range. That is also supported, of course, Guy, uh, by that RSI on bottom, losing momentum. It's going to be interesting to see whether or not this happens for GLD. And if it does, it would suggest the dollar's going higher and probably yields too. I'd like to lose a bit of momentum right now. There seems to be a lot of momentum out there. It's been a week of a lot of momentum. Trying to keep up has been tough. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Abigail, do a little. Um, Kaylee, let's talk a little bit about Apple. Um, execution was amazing this quarter, posting record quarterly sales well past Wall Street's estimates. Um, it was able to white work through some of the supply chain issues that have hit everybody else. CEO Tim Cook talking about that very issue on the earnings call. I think our supply chain actually uh, does, does very good considering the shortages because it's, it's a fast moving supply chain. The cycle times are very uh, short. So let's talk about this. Really solid execution. I think the only area they had problems was with the iPad. Ed Ludlow joining us now from San Francisco. Ed, I, I'm looking at Apple share price. It's up in a down day. So in, in some ways, we need to right. factor in the latter into what we see on the screen right now. But nevertheless, I'm surprised that the market isn't reacting more strongly to what looked like a pretty flawless quarter and maybe confirmation as well that Apple is a kind of a, a haven, a safe haven in all this volatility. Yeah, I mean, it's living up to that haven status, finding growth in a challenging environment. And you're right that the impacts of supply chain shortage, particularly a shortage of semiconductors, was limited to iPad, which was the only product segment that missed estimates in terms of sales. You've got record sales across Mac, wearables, services, and of course, the iPhone. And this is a global company. And there are markets like China where growth has been in question with the backdrop of the pandemic the Omicron variant at the end of last year. But even in China, they saw 21% growth. So it's becoming dependable. But what I found so fascinating is that Apple communicates a lot and very little at the same time. But they did seem to give some really nuanced guidance on an outlook for this current and the coming quarters. Well, yeah, Tim Cook saying that the March period is going to look a lot better in terms of supply chain challenges. Right. But Ed, when thinking about the read through into other technology here, which is what Dan Ives over at Wedbush said, you know, Apple indicating brighter skies ahead is a positive read through for tech. 
This is Apple. This is the Titan. So in theory, they have more market power to navigate these supply chain issues. How much of a read through is there really to other tech players that maybe just don't pull as much weight? Well, this goes to Guy's point. I'm looking at the Nasdaq 100, right? 15 stocks up, 86 down, and Apple is up 60 points. So it's, it's helping the index. But we, I thought we'd see more of big picture, right? In this earnings season, we've been so focused on outlook, but we haven't had much discussion of the macro picture. Somebody asked Tim Cook on the call, what is your read of the global economy right now? And he literally said, I'm not an economist. I'm not going to go there. And this is the frustration. You know, look on your screen, look at the companies that are reporting next week, particularly the advertisers. We forget that Meta, parent company of Facebook, uh, is essentially just advertising, right? We're so focused on its transition to the metaverse. But what we will get next week is a read through on the on the strength of the consumer because advertisers aren't going to spend if the consumers aren't coming out of hibernation. In terms of what we what we take away from Apple about the consumer, what is it, Ed? This is this is a hardware story. Software did really well and services did really well, but hardware continues to perform really strongly. The consumer is going to bump right. up against a whole range of problems this year. Did, did they talk about whether or not this is sustainable in any shape or form? Is this something they can continue right. to do? So the, the key takeaway, retail revenue, stores, Apple, shiny Apple stores, hit record levels despite the pandemic. That's kind of Apple's own words. With Omicron in the fourth quarter, that is surprising. You know, in China, like I said, consumers came out and bought the high-end products. You know, six out of ten MacBook buyers in China were first-time MacBook buyers. They'd never owned the product before. But then that's what I'm talking about with the nuance on guidance. They said year on year, the March quarter or their fiscal second quarter will see strong growth. But quarter on quarter, from December to the March quarter, it will slow down and margins will be impacted by inflation and rising commodity costs, higher input costs from supply chain crunches. There is a sense that it was a smashing quarter in the fourth quarter. But things, even if the supply chain improve, that level of growth may not continue in the first six months of the year, yep. even though the consumer is strong in this environment. On the other side of supply chain issues, I still remember Snap's earnings from the previous quarter where it said that it was experiencing a slump in revenue because advertisers didn't want to advertise their products. They didn't want to right. stimulate demand if they couldn't meet it with supply. Is there a sense that that story has now changed as we look forward to the metas and alphabets of next week? So quick thing, tying it back to Apple, that was the holiday quarter that we we're talking about, the mm. time where people do buy iPhones and, and these expensive high-end products. Right. The March quarter is a different story. And, and on the ad spend, you know, I think that travel, for example, was heavily impacted in, in the December quarter. If you look at the strength we saw with Facebook or Meta and the likes of Google and Alphabet with its search ads, this, the rebounds during the pandemic period came when travel restrictions eased, when consumers mm. felt confident to leave their homes and search for other things to do. So that will be the narrative we look to. What is the consumer doing in this next phase of economic rebound, if there is an economic rebound with Omicron or, or, or a transition to an endemic from a pandemic? If they start searching for travel, for example, then you'd expect that we'll see the high double digits growth in digital ads that Bloomberg Intelligence and others are forecasting. All right. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Always super smart out there in San Francisco. Now coming up, your favorite snack foods like Oreos may soon cost you a little bit more. Mondelez is expected to raise prices in order to fight off inflation. We'll be talking about that with the company's chairman and CEO, Dirk Vandeput, next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishi Gupta. You're looking at a live shot in the principal room. Coming up, Carla Harris and Morgan Stanley, senior client advisor, joining Bloomberg TV, 2.30 p.m. New York, 7.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. So inflation eating into profits pretty much across the board. One area we're certainly seeing it uh, is in snacking, Oreos. Cadbury. Let's talk about what is happening with the maker of those products. Mondelez reporting fourth quarter earnings today. Missing estimates like lots of other companies. Mondelez is dealing 
with supply chain issues, higher input costs when it comes to commodity prices, labour shortages a huge factor as well. There's also the additional headwind of what is happening in the currency market as well, which has certainly had an impact uh, on this set of numbers. Let's figure out what's going on. The company's chairman and CEO, Dirk van der Put, joining us now to give us his take. Dirk, great to speak with you uh, as ever. We really look forward to these conversations. Um, the currency looks like it's been a fairly big factor in terms of these numbers. Stripping that out, what does the underlying business look like right now? The underlying business is looking good uh, from a top line perspective. Um, the categories that we're in, um, are growing faster than they were before the pandemic, which is biscuits and chocolate in our case. Um, we see demand all around the world, very strong in North America, Europe, emerging markets. Um, and while the global growth of our categories used to be around the 3% mark, we're now well above four and sometimes at 6% in the case of chocolate. So all that is good. Our market shares, we, we have increased market shares compared to before the pandemic. And we did well in uh, Q4 as it relates to the bottom line. But if you look at the middle of the PL, I would say that's where it was a little bit more difficult. Still okay, 3.6% growth in gross profit, but we normally aim for four. And so we were a little bit below that. And that's a reflection of what you were mentioning, Guy supply chain disruption, inflation, labor shortages, and that weighs uh, on our costs. Pricing yeah. will kick in um, and that will solve that problem in the coming quarters. And then there is currency, which in 2021 was a tailwind for us. In uh, 2022, we expect that to be a headwind um, of about probably eight cents on our EPS and about two and a half percent on our top line. We still are expecting to deliver against our growth algorithm, which is a, a 3% plus top line growth and a mid single digit uh, bottom line growth. We will still do that, but uh, we will in reported results, it, we will see that effect of the currency. Dirk, let's talk about the pricing point in particular, which you mentioned. To this point, by and large, consumers have seen, toler have seen tolerant of higher prices. At what point do you think that tolerance changes? How do you gauge that level of how far you can push it before it starts to affect demand? Well, you, you, it is, has been so abnormal, I would say, that you almost have to gauge it as you go and see if the price increases have any effect on your volumes. As everybody has been saying, and we're seeing the same, so far, price increases have not had uh, a lot of effect on volumes. The reason being, to my opinion, um, uh, a few. Uh, one, consumers feel financially pretty good they saved uh, during the pandemic, so they feel like they're in a good place. Overall, there's a labor shortage, so people are well employed, they see their salaries go up. They've also changed their spending, uh, less discretionary spending, less travel, less eating out, and more importance to the home life, and so they're prepared to spend um, more on, on what they are consuming at home. And then our products are not uh, that expensive. They're an affordable treat. So all that makes that uh, our categories normally don't have a huge price elasticity, but in this particular case, it's very limited. I assume as the consumer will change and we get out of the pandemic and they start to spend more on other items, that then, and they start to eat out more and so on, that that's where the moment comes that they might not be so benign as it relates to the price elasticity. Let, let's just talk about where the consumer is right now, Dirk. We, we've come through Omicron. That looks now it's like it's now going to fade. As you say, that means that people will ultimately maybe be looking to go and eat out a little bit more. But what have they been doing during the pandemic? Have they been stocking up? What does what does the consumer's working capital look like right now? Uh, is the larder full? And does that mean that there'll be a bit of an overhang in terms of demand for product? Um, I think in certain items they did not not in ours. I would say they they get consumed. Um, I think what has changed in the in the world of snacking is that there is. Um, a change in mentality where snacking uh, more often to feel better, to have a little bit of stress relief um, is seen more uh, acceptable. And we just published last week our state of snacking report. And that's one of the key things that comes out of there. 80% of consumers say now, 
indulging once a day, having a chocolate or a biscuit is very acceptable. If you go two, three years back, that was not as high. And so in our case, it's not stocking, it's really more consumption that's going on. So changes in consumption behavior, are there any pandemic era changes that you don't think will stick, Dirk? Um, I, I do believe that the mobility will come back. Um, consumers at the moment spend 10 to 15% more time at home. Um, I think once they feel more uh, safe and they feel better and COVID is now endemic and we, we know how to control it, I think there will be sort of a, a return to mobility, which will have all types of side effects, um, less online buying, potentially more on the go buying, uh, more travel, more eating out, as we were discussing. I think that that is not going to uh, stick. And um, probably the, the other one that is not uh, going to stick is, is the, the amount of time that is being spent at home. Um, I do think people will go back to the office more. Uh, and, and so as a consequence, uh, the home consumption will come down and uh, um, on the go consumption will go up. Um, but for the rest, uh, what, what else did we see? We see much higher e-commerce, online buying. I think that will, will still uh, remain the same, for instance. Dirk, as you say, people are starting to go back to work, and I'm sure that probably applies to, to your business as well. Um, can you just talk me through what it's been like over the last few weeks and months in terms of staff outages, um, what you've seen in terms of the production lines? Have you had any issues there? Have there, for instance, ha has there been any demand out there that you haven't been able to fill because of what has been happening with Omicron? Mm, yes, yes. Um, I would say we've certainly seen an increase in absenteeism. And in our offices, that, is, uh, that, that was not really an issue because we were still working from home. We delayed the reopening of our offices. In our plants and in the fields, our sales force, uh, that is a bigger issue, of course. It hasn't been worse than uh, it was at the start of the pandemic, where you you know there was the, the famous tracing, and if you had a contact, you had to stay at home. So the absenteeism level that we've seen is been, has been similar to the start of the pandemic, which does have uh, effect on our uh, potential or our possibility to supply uh, to supply the different orders. Add to that on top the labor shortages, add to that the transportation issues. And, and yes, uh, we measure something called on-shelf availability, which we like to be well above 95, at least 97%, um, which means of all the items you expect to have in a store, 97% is there. We're now more at 90%. So uh, yes, the, the availability of our products has been affected by this. Obviously, when we're talking about Omicron and pandemic-related impacts, in China, there's a very specific story. It is a COVID-0 policy. We pay a lot of attention to that. When we're thinking about China and other markets in the emerging world relative to the developing one, what differences and divergences are you seeing in terms of how it affects your business? We, we still have markets around the world where... Um, the whole country needs to go down in a severe lockdown because the, the use of uh, vaccines is, uh, uh, or the availability of vaccines is not as high. And so at the moment it's Southeast Asia that is severely affected. And so we have issues like we need to um, stop our plans for a number of days. We cannot have our sales force go out. Stores might not be open. So that severely affects uh, our business. Um, that sort of moves around the world. We'll see, for instance, what's going to happen now in Latin America as Omicron is starting to appear there. Vaccination rates in Latin America are relatively high in the most important countries. So I assume it will not have the uh, profound effect as, uh, as we are currently seeing in, in Vietnam or in the Philippines and so on. Um, for the rest, it... it just interferes if you look at the US and, and uh, Europe where vaccination rates are relatively okay, I would say, um, it just um, puts us back into this sort of uh, crisis mode that we had during the beginning of the pandemic, where we have to focus on a limited number of SKUs, where we have to uh, sort of manage attendance on a day-to-day -day basis, yep. and it disrupts normal operations. 
Dirk, um, this is going to sound like a strange question. What is hot in snacking right now? <laughs> what do you see the trends being? What is going to be interesting? And how do you think you're going to take advantage of any of these trends? Is it organically? Is it via M&A? Um, for sure, although I was talking about the indulgence factor, um, uh, that is something that is, is quite unique. Suddenly the consumer saying, hey, it's okay to, to indulge myself every day. That is a big change of uh, mentality. And so you will see heavy indulgent items like uh, premium chocolate and so on they, that, will do, that will do well. Um, the other one is that uh, health and wellness is still there. And I think that trend will come back as we feel better about uh, the pandemic. Um, and that will continue to grow. So for instance, we've launched uh, in recent months, um, we've launched an Oreo uh, zero sugar in China, or we, or we have launched a Cadbury vegan in, in the UK, a Philadelphia vegan in the UK, uh, plant-based. So I think those are, um, those are some of the trends that you will see. It's sort of a yin and a yang, heavy indulgence or higher indulgence. Well, at the same time, health and wellness keeps on growing gradually and more and more consumers yeah. are gonna do both. And so that's that's really what is uh, quite unique about this uh, situation. Everything in moderation, so they say. Thank you so much for joining us, Dirk Vandeput, Mondelez International Chairman and CEO. Appreciate your time. This is Bloomberg.